thank you so much for joining us. We pray that you will be really blessed as we worship, open the word and welcome the spirit together this morning. Thank you to all of you who joined us for our first Abide on Wednesday evening. Abide is an opportunity for us to practice the presence of God and connect to the Father's love for us. It's not a prayer meeting or a teaching session. It doesn't have an agenda. It's just about seeking him and resting in him. Join us for the next Abide on Wednesday the 17th of February and every fortnight throughout Lent until Easter. It doesn't matter if you came along to the first session or not. It doesn't matter if you can't stay the whole time each time. I'd just love to encourage you to engage with this unique opportunity to experience God's love. Do get in touch with the office if you need any help getting set up with Zoom. The Roast on the Road team will be bringing a hot meal to the isolated in our community next Sunday again. Our young people have been looking at the nature of God in our resources this term and they're going to be making some special cards to pop into the delivery bag so that the recipients will know that they are remembered and loved by this church family but most importantly by God. Parents please check your inboxes if you missed the email about that earlier this week. Let's pray together. Father last week we spoke about your promise of restoration and renewing and we want to pray that promise over those who are known to us and particularly over those who are giving out so much at this time. We lift our NHS workers to you right now and we ask Lord that you would give them fresh air to breathe, that you would revive their weary bodies and bring comfort to them in their dark times. We pray that you would shine the light of your hope in the RUH and all the care and medical facilities in our city. Thank you for the compassion and kindness that has been shown to so many by doctors, nurses, chaplains, care workers and support staff. We pray for their protection physically, mentally and spiritually and ask that you would bless the work of their hands as they seek to bring health and healing to those in their care. Lord, we ask that they would find sanctuary and rest in you. We pray for those close to home in this neighbourhood who are struggling and who feel invisible. Lord, they're not invisible to you and we pray that you would break into their lives in surprising ways so that they would know that they are precious in your eyes. We lift up those who mourn, Lord. We weep with those who weep. Help us to shine your light where there's darkness, to share your love where there is fear and to invite your presence where there is emptiness. We thank you for the dedication and commitment of the teachers and staff in our local schools at St Philip's Primary, St Martin's Garden, Three Ways and St Gregory's. Lord, protect and sustain them in this coming week and pour your refreshing over them during the half term break. We lift families to you as they try to juggle the many pressures of this season. Lord, we ask that you would pour your peace into our homes, that the reassurance of your voice would still the frustration of these days and that our children would be filled with inexplicable joy in spite of the challenges and difficulties that they're experiencing through the power of your Holy Spirit working in them. Yes, Lord, we pray for the national situation for our leaders, both elected and non-elected, the decision makers, influencers. Lord, would your wisdom prevail? And where there is uncertainty, would you bring clarity? Father, we pray for a pulling together for the good of this country and that personal and political agendas would be set aside. Emboldened Christian leaders, Lord, we pray to speak your truth at all levels of government and wider society, and may this nation acknowledge you again. Lord, we put our trust in you and we say that you are all we need. Come and fill our hearts afresh this morning. Holy Spirit, as we worship you now. Amen. So come, now is the time to worship, come, now is the time to give your heart, so come, just as you are to Just as you are before your God, so come. Now is. 
hands that sign to worship come now is the time to give your heart so come just as you are to Just as you are before your God, so come, and now is the time to worship, come, now is the time to give.
Stir it up 
Stir it up in our hearts. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts. Passion for your name. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts. Passion for your name. Let your spirit come and fall on us. spirit to come oh let your spirit come let your spirit come cause we want more oh we want more oh we long for more oh we long for more oh we long for Jesus, we want it all. Set our hearts to place as we dance in the waves. Set our hearts to place. So let your spirit fall. Oh, Jesus, we want it all set our hearts ablaze as we dance in the way set our hearts ablaze sing your wave sing your way sing your wave sing your way Sing your way, sing your way. Sing your way, sing your way.
Can you believe that it is week six already of Standing on the Promises? Time does funny things in lockdown. In week one of this series, we looked at how promise is absolutely essential to God's being, his nature and his relationship with us. Then over the following weeks, we've looked at God's promise of his presence, his faithfulness, his provision and his restoration. This morning, I want to talk to you about God's promise of prosperity. So open your Bible and turn to Jeremiah 29. We're going to look together at one of the most quoted verses in Scripture. And no wonder it's a belter. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Probably more than half of us have a fridge magnet or a key ring or a greetings card with that verse on it. It's a great promise of God. Just to be clear from the start, when I say the promise of prosperity, I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel. I mean prosperity as in to prosper, to live abundantly. The King James translates it as peace. It's God's promise that you will thrive and flourish. We're going to read verses 4 to 14 and then we'll look at what this promise is doing, how you can stand on it and how you can be transformed by fully and faithfully claiming it over your life. So let's look at Isaiah 29, starting at Jeremiah 29, starting at verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. How can you stand on the promise of God that you will prosper and flourish? I'm going to offer just two observations from our passage today. The first is this. If you want to stand on God's promise that you will prosper, don't resist where he has put you. I reckon many of us can identify with the feeling of being in exile at the moment. Our lives are interrupted, our plans are frustrated, our futures are uncertain, our finances may be vulnerable. Or there are many other challenges maybe in your life that are not COVID related. You may be dealing with heartaches that have been around for a very long time. Relationships, health issues, disappointment, fears or addictions. You may feel that your life is in a permanent state of exile. But that is not meant to be the case. And one of the things that is so encouraging about our passage today is that the promise contained in it is specifically made 
to those who are in exile. Through Jeremiah, God is addressing his people exiled in Babylon. If you feel that you are in exile at the moment, then listen up. This promise is for you. Now, let's look at verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. All those I carried into exile. Who carried them into exile? The Babylonians? No, God carried them there. That's important to note. It was God who put them into exile. If you're facing challenges at the moment, I wonder what your opinion is of those challenges. Do you believe that they are part of God's plan or an attack of the enemy? That's not always an easy question to answer and I'm not going to attempt to do so now, but I do want us to note that our passage today makes a dynamic about Babylonian exile very clear. God was the one who carried them into exile and that's important because it means that the exile wasn't a blip in God's plan, the exile was part of God's plan. So I guess my question to you and to myself is, are you living in a place of trusting God in your exile? Or are you resisting where God has put you? I'm not going to go so far as to say that God has brought the challenges in your life upon you. I've preached before about how, for example, I believe that COVID is not God's will. Discipline is a feature of the exile in Babylon, but that is not what I'm talking about here. I'm not applying that to your personal circumstances. It may be part of what you're going through or it may not. I'm not establishing a principle about discipline this morning. I'm just asking if you believe that even though something may not be in God's will, that doesn't mean that it is outside his plan and therefore outside his control, his sovereignty and his promises. It wasn't God's will that the Israelites lived in disobedience and it wasn't his will that they should have to be disciplined. But that doesn't mean that their period of exile was because God was powerless or he had abandoned them or that they had somehow fallen out of his plan for them. Elsewhere in scripture, the Bible tells us that God makes all things work to the good of those who love him. As Lisa reminded us last week, there is no challenge, no mountain, no place of devastation that he cannot redeem. Though we may be in exile, through our own fault or through the fault of others or through the fault of the enemy, for whatever reason, though we may be in exile, he can turn any devastated season in our lives into something that leads to our prosperity. The question is, how are we going to inhabit that season? How are we going to conduct ourselves while we are in exile? It's clear in our reading today that though the people were exiled and bereft under the dominion of a pagan and godless society, even so, God was working out his plan. And that plan was all about the prosperity of his people. So he commands them to live in a mindset of faith in order to release the reality of that prosperity. Though you are in exile, he says, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, marry, have children, have grandchildren, and crucially, seek the prosperity of the city in which I have put you. God is calling his people to view their exile with his perspective and to activate their faith by living with a prosperity mindset. And so he tells them to pray. Pray for the city that it might prosper, because if it thrives, you too will thrive. Despite their circumstances, God calls them to activate their faith in very practical ways, to position them for the flourishing that he is going to bring them into. It's a whole separate point in itself, but note why. Because God always intended his people to be blessed so that they could be a blessing. If you spend your exile resisting God because of your circumstances, you will disqualify yourself from being in a position to bring God's blessing to your family, to your children, your street, your neighbourhood and your city, so that they can flourish. It's tempting to think that God is absent in difficult times and that he has let us down. But when we believe that God is absent in our exile, we spend all of our energy resenting where we are and wishing that he would come back and rescue us. So we grab verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, we put them on our fridge or we write them in our journals and start praying that God would take us out of the exile we are in. And we don't ask God how we should conduct ourselves while we are still in exile. We forget how he operates. The Bible tells us that he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies, that he causes rivers to flow in the wilderness. Can you see from our passage that if you 
align with God's perspective on your life and God's promises over your life, your moment of greatest difficulty may just be God's springboard for your greatest flourishing and the flourishing of those around you. Don't resist where God has put you. When we impose our plan and our timing and our solution, we always separate ourselves from the sovereign plans of God. This is what the Israelites are doing in Jeremiah. Take a look at verses 8 to 10. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to you and bring you back out of this place. What's going on here? Well, the people were desperate to be freed from exile and, and all they wanted was just to get out of there. It's very understandable, but their desperation had caused them to turn their attention away from God and not listen to him. Instead, they're listening to false prophets who were promising deliverance and timescales outside of God's plan. We read about one in chapter 28. It's a false prophet called Hananiah. And he'd been saying that the exile would last for only two years and the people were lapping it up. Did you notice what Jeremiah says in verse eight of our reading? These false prophets are speaking from, he says, the dreams you encourage them to have. The dreams you encourage them to have. That's an interesting phrase. They're not speaking the word of the Lord. They're speaking out of human desire, desire that is unyielded to the Lord. So they're telling the people what they want to hear. They're offering false hope. They're articulating a plan that is not the Lord's. But in contrast, the Lord's prophet Jeremiah does hear the Father's plan. And it is very different, not two years, but 70 years. That is a long exile. God says, forget false hope and moaning about your situation. Don't look to false prophets. Look to where I have put you. A prerequisite for this promise is that we yield our desires to the Lord. He says, though you are in exile, put your trust in me. Even in your circumstances, live obediently so that you can live abundantly. That is very counterintuitive. But our reading today is saying that the promise of prosperity starts with how we react to the exile we are in now. This promise is about submitting to God's plan, not our own. If you want to stand on this promise that you will prosper, you have to do something none of us finds easy. You have to trust God, you have to yield to God, and you have to get on with living in obedience to God now. Notice the specific wording of God's promise. Verse 11 doesn't say that God has a future plan. It says that God has a plan for your future. The reality is that where you are right now is part of the plan. And if you are to stand on this promise, start by not resisting the place God has put you. You can't walk into his future for you if you don't honour his present for you. First, don't resist the place God has put you. Second, instead of focusing on what is going wrong, focus your attention on being restored to the promise of the Lord. Think about your exile right now, whatever circumstances you are facing, whatever your situation, what are you able to do? You can't change the circumstances. The virus is still disrupting your business. You've had the vaccine, but you still can't get out and about and see your friends. You really want to worship together again, but the church building is still closed. Your grown up children have still not returned to the Lord, despite your best efforts to influence them positively. Your friend has still not forgiven you, no matter what you've tried to do to reconcile with them. Whatever your circumstances, you can't alter the situation in your own strength. You're not in a position to change it. What are you in a position to do? You are in a position in the middle of your exile to pursue the Lord, to focus all of your attention on him rather than being distracted by your circumstances. This is the key to the promise in Jeremiah 29. Listen to verses 12 to 14 again. Call on me and come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. That is the key. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. 
Crisis in our lives quickly divides our affections. We turn elsewhere, we scrabble around looking for help in places other than his presence. But God knows what is best for us and he's giving us the key to flourishing here. It is undivided affection for him. When you seek me with all your heart, instead of focusing on what is going wrong, focus your attention on being restored to the Lord. This is the key to standing on this promise. It's the key to claiming it over your life and walking into it in a transformative way. And it's a heart key. Seek him with all your heart. It's about rediscovering your heart to heart connection with the Father who has made a promise to you that you will know prosperity, that you will flourish and thrive. It's a call to honour the very heart of the Father for you. That's where this promise has come from. It has come from the Father's heart. This Father who says that when you seek him, when you turn your affection in your own heart to him, he will come to you to fulfill his good promise to bring you back for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future your prosperity your flourishing your happiness is the very heartbeat of God you have to accept that if you are to know the fruit of his promise to you seek him with all all your heart that's the key as one pastor recently said you are responsible for what you allow to influence your heart. If you give more attention and have more input from social media or mainstream media than the word and spirit of God, then your discouragement is self-inflicted. You are responsible for what you allow to influence your heart. If you divide your affections while you are in exile, you will put yourself in danger of coming to the conclusion that God is absent you will feel so disconnected from him that you won't perceive his presence, his purposes or his plan. You'll end up having faith as tiny as a little pilot light. Our father does not want us to do that. He doesn't want us to entertain thoughts that are not of him. He doesn't want us to come into agreement with perspectives that are not his. He wants us to seek him with our whole hearts. Don't make the mistake of looking at your circumstances to come to a conclusion about what God is like. Look to his promises to discover what he's like. God is completely for you. He has not forsaken you. He is not powerless. He's completely loving towards you. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to come to no harm. He wants you to have hope. He wants you to know that you have a future. This is the power of Jeremiah 29 11, frequently quoted on fridge magnets and coasters, but don't let its familiarity diminish its power. This is a deeply significant and life-changing promise of God. If you want to stand on God's promise that you will prosper, don't resist where he has put you. Instead, focus your attention on being restored to the promise of the Lord by seeking him with your whole heart. Why don't we take a minute or two just to respond? I love the King James version of Jeremiah 29 11. It translates the word plans as thoughts. I know the thoughts I have for you. I love that. Sometimes I think we can dismiss the word plans almost as if it's something too far in the future that can't impact us in the present. But thoughts seems to me to be so much more present. He knows the thoughts that he is having about you right in this moment thoughts of a loving and attentive father who is consumed with love for you, who longs for you to be happy and whole and safe and free and hopeful. These are the thoughts of a father that are so powerfully articulated in the giving by a father of his son to take on flesh and die on a cross that the heart of God would be revealed to us and that we would be forever lifted out of exile and into the warmth of his embrace. This promise today makes absolutely no sense without a revelation of the heart of a loving father. It's the heart key to unlock this promise to you and restore you to a place of confidence. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Come Holy Spirit, we want to connect with the heart of the Father right in this moment. Wow, wow. Thank you, Lord. Give us a revelation of the Father's heart. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. 
I do believe there's an opportunity this morning to repent. Repent of resenting where we are right now, resenting our lives, being frustrated with God, accusing him of abandoning us. You know that repentance is literally just turning around and reorientating to God. The second point of our sermon today to turn away from rebellion, our own agendas, our own time scales, our own thoughts, our own opinions of what God should be doing in our lives, to turn away from that and to reorientate fully to the Father this morning. To ask him to renew our faith in his promises to us. This morning's just another opportunity as well. Look, we, we know in our heads that he's a good father, but we've got to breathe that truth like oxygen. Especially when we are in exile, especially when we are in the devastated place, when we are in the wilderness, when we're in the valleys, when we are desperate. We've got to renew our heart's connection to the father's heart and say, yes, you are a good and perfect father. Yes, you love me. Yes, you have not forsaken me. Yes, you have a good and perfect plan. You have not forgotten me. You have not forgotten your plan. You are not holding yourself at a distance from me. You are not hiding from me. You are fully available to me because you've made a covenant promise that when I seek you with all of my heart, I will find you. I'll find you, Father. I'll find you. Lord, we don't want divided affections. We don't want divided hearts. We want our whole hearts to fully embrace the truth of your promise spoken over us this morning. A good and perfect Father with a good and perfect plan. You long, Father, for my prosperity. You long, Father, that I would thrive. Just join with me as I make these declarations. Say them out loud. Sometimes you have to activate your voice to activate your faith. So even though it may seem weird in your living room right now, or wherever you are, listening, walking, the dog, whatever it is, why don't you make these declarations with me right now? You are a good Father. Just repeat them after me. You are a good Father. You long for my prosperity. Your thoughts about me are for my good. You want me to thrive. You want me to flourish. You want me to prosper. You want me to have hope. You will be found when I seek you with all my heart. You are a good and perfect Father. Lord, I thank you that you've given us a key, a key to unlock this promise of your blessing on our lives, a key to unlock a way through the wilderness, a way through the exile and a way into the fulfilled promise that you will bring us to a place of flourishing. Just have that phrase, I believe, help my unbelief. If the Lord is awakening this morning, a desperation, you're feeling it, you almost don't want to feel it. You've tried to bury this stuff in the past, but if you're truthful about it, you are desperate for God to bring you out of exile, to bring you into this promise of prosperity. You are desperate to have a renewed perspective on what you are going through right now. The Lord is awakening in your heart a renewed, it's a hunger, but it's just a desperate cry. Father, I need you. I want you. Then I want to invite you to come this morning in response to that desperation to the prayer ministry Zoom room. You can come for prayer for anything. We went after healing on Tuesday morning's prayer meeting. It was brilliant. We've got great testimonies of what God has been doing. But whether it's for healing, whether it's about 
uh, the season in your life that you just need God to intervene, whether you just long for a closer and deeper touch from him or whatever the reason is, join us in the prayer ministry Zoom room after this service. We would love to pray for you. There's a team of people who'll be waiting for you. Let's worship together again now as we continue to rest in his good thoughts towards us and his great love for us. You got a promise, all your promises are true. The God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven. You do just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I remain steadfast. And let my heart know when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great. Is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same? I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Yes, you are faithful.
faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sun, we praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. And I put my faith, and I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. You never let me down. Prime Ministry Zoom room is now open and the details will appear on your screen in a moment. Take a note of the password which is going to flash up on your screen right now. If you'd like someone from the Prime Ministry team to pray with you about anything at all, they're ready and waiting. And thank you so much to all of the prayer team who faithfully log on each week, your superstars. Have a great week and we'll see you again next Sunday. May the blessing of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Amen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.